class today. He is an expert in um, the immune system and really cancer in the brain, right? Those, yeah. the interface of those areas. Um, let me say by way of introduction that um, this is, it's, it's, this is a real opportunity for you guys to hear. This is not exactly what he works on. This I've asked him and Josh Goley last week to speak a little bit out of their comfort zone because they don't work on rhythms, but basically to take where they are and look at how it interfaces with rhythms. So a lot of this is new to them. So that's one of the one of the fun things about the class. And so some of them are getting their minds expanded. Now, is is most of uh, immunology funded out of the National Institute for uh, what's it called? Uh, Allergy and Infectious Disease? Um, a lot of it, yeah. Because they're having a workshop. I heard, I was in Chicago at a meeting last week. They're having a workshop on clocks and the immune system that Fred Turek is going to go speak right. at this spring. So this is a new, very new area, just the interface of clocks and, and the immune system. Right. So, okay. This is our last session before spring break. I hope you guys all have a great spring break because I tell you, I am planning. <laughs> Just to write a few papers, right, guys? <laughs> um, and then we meet the Wednesday after spring break, and I'm not sure what's on that week, but we'll find out. We'll send that out to you. But anyway, I'm just going to go all the way around okay. and take my place. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, as uh, Martha said, the reason I agreed to do this is because, not because I do know about the immune system and, and circadian rhythm, but because I don't know about it. And I thought I should find out what um, there is to know about it. So um, I have been reading, and as usual, it's a very complex uh, area. So probably, uh, and, and actually to tell you the truth, in terms of some of the specific application kind of things that I wanted to get to, as I looked at those papers and a couple that um, were put on reserve for you uh, kind of indicate this, um, the effects are, are not overwhelming. But, so it's difficult to judge how important they are. Okay, so this is one of those fields where um, it, circadian rhythms could be important, uh, but it's not clear. And I'll, I'll get to uh, why that may be in, in a minute. So um, yeah, so that's why I was a little reluctant to have it filmed, because it's not one of these prepared lectures where I uh, have everything organized and, and presenting it, it's, it's sort of early in the exploration of this. Okay, so uh, I thought, it, I mean, you guys have already heard a number of lectures about the circadian rhythm uh, system, and you know that everything is affected by circadian, circadian rhythm. So it's no surprise that the immune system is affected by circadian rhythms. But in order to uh, explain that and talk about that, I figured I needed to spend some time telling you about the immune system. So, so what are your backgrounds generally? Uh, neuroscience or? Well, there's a whole range. So we have a so, mixture of undergraduate and graduates. Why don't we go just okay. go around, John? Yeah, tell me who we uh, are. My name is John. I'm a senior, and uh, I'm majoring in integrated biology. Okay. And so, and tell me that, and tell me if you have uh, background in circadian rhythms or is this is like. No, I have no this background in circadian rhythms. Okay. This is my first course taken. Okay. Uh, I'm Harry. I'm a fifth year grad student in Martha's lab. Uh, I'm an MSP student, and I actually just took immunology in the med school, so this okay. is pretty fresh. Um, I'm Aoi. I'm an undergrad, uh, molecular cellular biology, and uh, I work in Martha's lab, and I've worked in other circadian labs. Okay. Um, I'm Lacey. I'm a junior in molecular and cellular biology, and I'm in Martha's lab. I'm Alex, and I'm a senior in molecular and cellular biology, and no experiences. I'm Gazelle, first year in neuroscience, um, grad student in Martha's lab. My research is at the Circuit University. I'm Mia, I'm a second year grad student in molecular integrated physiology, and I'm in Martha's lab. Okay. <laughs> You're a visitor, but go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Jenny. <laughs> I'm a junior in molecular and cellular biology, and I have no type of, uh, never really learned anything about circadian rhythms before. So. I'm Grace, I'm an undergrad, molecular and cellular biology, and I also work in Martha's lab. Okay. Okay, I'm 
was I'm an undergrad in molecular and cellular biology and I also work in okay. <laughs> I'm Liz, I'm MCV undergrad and I was in the class of no experience with okay. everything. I'm James. I'm a third year CDB graduate student. Where else are you? Super good. I'm Sam. I'm a third year grad student in Martha's lab and an MSP as well, and I just took you know with you as well. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, two people have any knowledge, so you can, if I'm forgetting something, you can uh, add in. Um, so uh, the reason that the immune system is important with respect to uh, the title of this seminar, which has to do with health and disease, is the immune system has a big effect on health and disease, right? It's the purpose of the immune system to uh, recognize pathogens and get rid of them. Now, uh, that's one aspect, but that's not the only aspect of, of the immune system that makes it important health and disease. Part of the processes by which they get rid of pathogens uh, include the inflammatory response, which is an early immune response to, to pathogens, and uh, that creates all kinds of changes in uh, physiology to help get rid of those pathogens. But very frequently, the inflammatory response occurs without the pathogen or when the pathogen is gone, or just the tissue damage, or to stress, or to all kinds of things that are not necessarily pathogen related. And very frequently, the, the inflammatory response itself is the disease. Okay? And so there's been a lot of interest in uh, inflammation in many other diseases where um, it had not been recognized. So for instance, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, for many years, Alzheimer's disease has been attributed to beta amyloid accumulation. Well, if you, you can have amyloid if you don't have an inflammatory response to amyloid, you don't have Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, it's the inflammation that ca actually causes the disease process. Similarly, in cardiovascular disease, uh, inflammation plays a key role in, in, in that as well. Cancer, in some cases, actually cancer goes both ways. The immune system uh, is chronically surveilling uh, the body and, and gets rid of tumors that you don't even know you had. And on the other hand, inflammation from low-grade immune responses creates cancer, particularly inflammatory bowel disease and things like that are responsible for uh, colon cancer and other types of cancer. Besides all those things, <clears throat> there are specific uh, responses of the immune system against self tissues that create diseases. So 5% of people have some sort of autoimmune disease, and that could be arthritis, could be diabetes, could be uh, multiple sclerosis. These are the diseases where the immune system inappropriately is activated against self tissues and causes damage. So um, there's all those disease things, and then also a lot of people don't make the connection that, that uh, the <clears throat> inflammatory responses and immune cytokines are uh, necessary for wound healing. So even if you have no pathogen, no chronic inflammation, the immune system is important in, uh, in wound healing. And um, there are variables. For, I, I haven't seen, I couldn't find anything on wound healing and circadian rhythms, but I'm not sure they're out there. Uh, there are other things like uh, stress hormones affecting, um, uh, cytokines affect wound healing. And <clears throat> those are some of the studies that I like that actually reduce uh, wounds in people either puncture your roof of your mouth or um, make a, a blister on your arm and look at the, the changes and those are affected by stress hormones and as I'm sure you've probably heard already stress hormones are one of the big things that fluctuate with circadian rhythm. Have you heard that yet? So, so what have you, yeah, which, which? Well, I, I, would, I always talk about that. Okay. So you, time you of day with respect to heart, uh, heart attacks and things like that. Okay. But, but not much on hormones. No, we haven't had much on hormones. I okay, you haven't done the cortisol rhythm. Okay, um, <clears throat> so how many of you have ever um, uh, used hydrocortisone creams for okay. Probably everybody, no? Maybe not. Uh, that's cortisol, okay? The reason why you put it on when you have a rash or some inflammation is because cortisol is anti-inflammatory. Cortisol is anti-inflammatory for pretty much every component of the immune response. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and cortisol has that <coughs> effect during normal physiological fluctuations, and cortisol has a nice circadian rhythm. So a lot of the things that will 
would be uh, affecting the immune system and give the appearance uh, of a circadian rhythm could be caused by uh, just the fluctuations in cortisol. So um, we'll go into some detail on that. But the, so there's sort of separate issues as to whether there's a, a circadian rhythm in the immune system itself, inherent, intrinsic to the immune system, and whether there's a functional circadian rhythm due to other mediators in, in both things, actually. Um, OK, so that's the immune system. Uh, besides that, I think it's uh, particularly interesting, just inherently. Uh, I was in, as a neuroscientist for uh, 20 years before I became a, an immunologist, and I think that both of them are equally interesting. Um, they're, they're clearly um, responding to pathogens is an important thing for the whole body, and as much as 10% of the genome is, is related to things that are involved in the immune system. Um, it is a complex system, and there are very many self-amplifying responses. And this is one of the issues is to, in terms of trying to figure out how important circadian rhythm things are. Circadian rhythms um, and other things like aging that are, you know, probably are very important have been ignored by immunologists for, for years and years and years because immunologists are used to seeing huge effects. Okay, so when a, you give a pathogen, you get at least a ten, if it's not a tenfold uh, change in something that's not that interesting to them. And when you look at things like circadian rhythms, there may be twofold or maybe 20%. Or so they haven't been as impressed by those kind of changes, but their self, most of the responses of the immune system are self-amplifying one way or another or self-inhibiting. So you get in these feedback cycles where if you, it's, it's sort of the butterfly effect, right? If you have a, a small effect that's amplified that can be critical to determining the outcome uh, eventually somewhere around the other side of the world. Um, similarly, they're self-limiting. So a lot of things that, one thing that people don't realize about the immune system, and it's really just been studied much within the last 10 years or so, is that shutting off an immune response is a very active process. Okay, so it's not just you have an immune response, the pathogen goes away, and your immune response just kind of dribbles out. There are everything that induces a, an inflammatory response, an activation of the system, also sets in motion things that will shut it off. And then once things shut it off, those things uh, are self-limiting and, and further shut it off. So you, you get an induction of uh, regulatory T cells, for instance. Those change the antigen presenting cells that induce more regulatory T cells. So you see positive feedback things that shut off as well as amplify. So because of that, these basically are nonlinearities. That makes it difficult to predict what's going to happen. And it makes it difficult to assess how important is a 20% change uh, in a response in the light and the dark. Okay. So um, health-wise, again, there's a lot of data out there suggesting there are factors, but when you look at some of them, they're not always that impressive. So it, it, I, I'd say you know, clearly there's an involvement in a circadian system in the, in the responses. And the more we know about it, the better. But it's because of these factors, it's taken a while for immunologists to, uh, to appreciate. <clears throat> so what is the immune system when we talk about that? It's a lot of different things. So it's both cells um, and soluble proteins uh, that uh, together um, eliminate pathogens. But there are some of those uh, cellular mediators are local, there's a lot of paracrine communication, and some of them are endocrine, so things will be circulated in the bloodstream. A lot of them are uh, very local, like there's um, actual synapses between the immune cells and uh, between the immune cells. So um, <coughs> th there's a lot of, of chemical communication. The other thing is that <coughs> pretty much every cell in your body has is part of the immune system, but it's not specialized for that. So in terms of uh, an antiviral response, you get an uh, interferon alpha response to, uh, that's inherent in all the cells of your body right, to, to start trying to get rid of the virus. Um, 
some things that we don't typically think of as the immune system have major roles in directing the immune response and release cytokines that affect the immune cells, so like the skin uh, is, a, is a big component of the immune system. Not only because of its barrier function keeping pathogens out, but it initiates responses, cytokines are released by uh, skin cells, uh, and, and a lot of the inflammatory conditions are related to um, that aspect of, of skin function. So, <clears throat> but what people typically talk about when you talk about the immune system is those cells that are specialized for that function, and typically white blood cells uh, in, that are circulating in the body and also in uh, particular organs. Uh, th there's some localization in specialized organs, and some of them are distributed through tissues throughout the body. So every tissue pretty much has some resonant macrophage type cell. So like microglia are that cell in the brain, uh, poop for cells in the, in the liver, and so forth. So some of them are resonant. Mast cells are also resonant along um, points of entry in the body. Uh, in the gut, for instance, in the airways, in the skin. Uh, and these are all uh, points of entry for pathogens, so there's especially uh, heavy localization of uh, immune cells that are distributed in those systems. Okay, so um, I like to also, just because my background is neuroscience, make the, 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 some of the analogies between uh, the nervous system and uh, the immune system, because the more I have learned about them, the less different they seem to me. And I would also include the endocrine system in this. So, uh, hormones, the nervous system, and the immune system are really, we're all part of the same thing, they're just somewhat specialized, they're not separate systems. And in fact, pretty much everything that's a neurotransmitter, <coughs> immune cells have receptors for it, and everything that was discovered as a cytokine in the immune system affects brain function, neurons directly, and is used as a neuromodulator uh, within the brain. So uh, there's a lot of, of, of parallels that way. Also, functionally, uh, to me, the immune system is like a mobile uh, brain. Okay? So we don't have a lot of long processes that make you stay in one place, but it, it has the same functions. It has a sensory function. Uh, the main purpose is to recognize pathogens in a specific way, just like a sen sensory modality for light versus air pressure changes, for hearing versus... Uh, so the different modalities of, of pathogens are recognized by specific receptors in the, so they're responsive to environmental stimuli. Uh, the, the input from these is integrated in a, a central place in lymph nodes in particular, and then there's a motor output, which uh, in, is in the immune system where cells are dispatched to get rid of the, the pathogens. There's also the, the parallel that memory is a, a, an aspect of both uh, brain function and immune system, and this is the basis for vaccination. The fact that um, once an immune response has been uh, stimulated against a particular antigen, there's amplification, and then those cells are at higher uh, baseline incidence, and they respond more quickly on the next time you see them. So immune memory is a, a, a classic component of the system. And then again, I mentioned already the chemical messengers are identical, uh, and even to the point where the uh, immune system has synapses that um, among cells and there's intracellular communication that way as well. Um, so where are they? <coughs> they're circulating in the, in the blood and lymph cells in the resident tissue. Uh, they're categorized according to whether or not um, they're in uh, organs that, are, that uh, in the, are in the early development of the immune system. So the bone marrow and the thymus are considered the central organs and bone marrow is where the B cells differentiate, uh, and thymus is where T cells uh, differentiate. Uh, and then after they uh, develop there, they go out into the lymph nodes and spleen, and those are the per peripheral uh, organs, and the site where antigens are actually presented uh, and active cells are activated. Okay, so, and this is just, uh, there's also a, a separate circulatory system uh, for the, um, immune system, the lymphatic system. So um, something that's not necessarily heavily um, emphasized in, in physiology, but it's, it contributes to the circulatory system. So every time your blood passes through capillaries, there's some 
uh, leakage out of those capillaries, and that fluid in the interstitial space now has to get back someplace. It actually goes into the lymphatic system, there's, there's lymphatic vessels, that then go back to the heart. There's no beating that forces it back. What's actually required is uh, contraction of muscles, right? Because what the, the lymphatic system has to generate that flow is just one-way valves. So there's no pump, but there's one-way valves. So anytime you squeeze the lymphatic system, it moves one direction and doesn't flow back. And that's why if you don't have that operating properly, you develop edema. So now if you're in the hospital, they put these little squeezy things on your legs and squeeze you a little small. That's to just keep the, the extracellular fluid going, that's leaked out of your uh, circulatory system, going back through the lymphatics, and, and then goes back into the blood um, by the subclavian vein there. So I just wanted to emphasize that that's part of the uh, circulation of the immune system. Okay, the other uh, thing within the immune system um, that's important in terms of a very rapid overview of the whole immune system is a, it's, and this is a kind of an artificial separation, but things are described as being part of the innate uh, system or the adaptive system. It's not completely artificial because there are animals that have only the innate system, right? So it, it can be separated. But in, in mammals, they function, they're totally integrated. So the, the innate system activates the adaptive system, but then the adaptive system uses the innate system as its effective function to, to actually kill the pathogens. The difference is the innate system <coughs> is uh, the initial recognition of the pathogen. Right? So this would be macrophages, dendritic cells, things that don't, that are um, recognized general patterns of, of pathogens, but they're not really highly precise like the adaptive system. What they, they've been evolved to uh, respond to conserved aspects of pathogens. So but if you get a different flu version every year, uh, the, the innate system can't handle that because it's not changing. It's only because uh, long-term aspects of pathogens that are that conserved is responded to. Um, but then, <clears throat> And also, it doesn't uh, change much with a second exposure to a pathogen. But it, it's ready immediately, because it's there and waiting. Whereas the adaptive system is also called the acquired system, because it takes some time. Uh, and this would be the, what a lot of people classically think of as the immune system, the B cells and T cells. Uh, and the B cells make antibodies. And that's what recognizes the, the pathogen and the T cells are specific. So, What's unique about the adaptive system is the recognition is extremely specific. So, and that's because there's a huge diversity of different specificities waiting in your body. There may be, say, two B cells that recognize a particular molecular pattern. But when that happens, they expand exponentially. That takes some time. Right? So your innate, your innate system has to hold off the disease process long enough for your adaptive system to expand the, the cells it recognized with precision. Once they do, though, the next time you're exposed to that, then you have immediate protection or a much more rapid protection available. And that's the basis of vaccination. So you're exposed to a piece of a pathogen um, that isn't going to kill you, and you, you expand those cells, and now you have those cells as uh, memory cells ready to go if you have our exposed. Okay, so um, that's the T cells. I mean, actually, I wasn't going to include that. There's, there's you know, more components. Okay, <clears throat> so the adaptive system requires time to become effective. Um, there's a lot of interest in terms of molecular biology of how that diversity of, of B cells and T cells is created because genes actually rearrange them, not encoded in the germline. Um, there's been a lot of interest in that for a while. People thought that might happen in the brain, but it uh, hasn't been shown for um, Okay, the cells that are effective against a particular pathogen proliferate in response to that. There's memory and then the second exposure is, is faster. So the way that would happen, typically the way they would work together, if, if you have a wound, um, then the, the components of the innate system, like mast cells and macrophages and dendritic cells down at the bottom, the green one, would um, take up pieces of the pathogen, 
uh, they would start an inflammatory response. The, basically, an inflammatory response is what it does is allows things to get out of the blood system. So all the features, classic features of an inflammatory response are due to that effect on the vasculature. It becomes leaky, so you get redness, you get swelling, you get heat, uh, and, and then after the pain it is also related to uh, things that are released from blood cells. Okay, that allows neutrophils to come in, and they're a, a major part of the innate system as well, that will start killing things uh, in a general way. The innate system tends to be uh, like napalm. Okay? There's a lot of collateral damage. Right? So you don't want to really depend on the innate system. You want to get something to, to be a little more selective. So uh, that's why the little green dendritic cell, after it's activated, takes off <coughs> and heads out uh, through the lymphatic system, and heads to the lymph node. Okay. Where are we going? All right. What do I have here? That's him leaving to the neck. All right. And then once the dendritic cell gets to the lymph node, it takes up residence there and puts out pieces of the pathogen on its surface. And then all the T cells just mingle. It's like a big cocktail party. They're, uh, they're just going from one to another. And then finally, if there's something magic happens between them, then they engage in something more uh, prolonged. And <clears throat> that would activate the T cell. It goes and proliferates. And now once it's proliferated and activated, it goes back out and kills the pathogen wherever it is in the body. Okay, so uh, this is the central processing of the response. And this is where the, the innate system um, <clears throat> creates the activation of the adaptive system. And, and B cells come into play as well. OK. so. Uh, <clears throat> What's that? Is there, a, is there a circadian rhythm in this? Of course there's a circadian rhythm. Uh, immune responses uh, fluctuate across the 24-hour period, right? But the next point, I think, is the key point that makes it complicated, is some things, some components of the system keep in light and some keep in dark. It's not <coughs> like you can say the immune response is better at one phase than the other. It all depends on which component of the system you, you look at. So that's probably you know why it's complicated, is it's not one way or the other. In terms of how it happens, um, I mentioned before that there are uh, systemic mediators, in particular um, hormones. And the, the, the two most important hormones are cortisol, as I mentioned, but also epinephrine, or the sympathetic nervous system. Both of those show uh, circadian fluctuations, and both of those have major impacts on uh, components of the immune system. Right? But there is also, and I think what Marco was referring to with the, um, this now interest among immunologists in circadian things, is that the clock genes uh, do fluctuate in immune cells. So there is an intrinsic component to the immune uh, system circadian rhythm as well. And as I understand it from General things with circadian rhythms is the the SCN tends to entrain all these peripheral rhythms. Is that still what you think? So there there are clocks in T cells, uh, and there are clocks in all in macrophages and T cells, uh, BMOL, clock, per two, and these think three. Those things fluctuate if you take immune cells out and put them in addition. Look at that fluctuation. So there are uh, intrinsic. Um, clock gene fluctuations that, that affect the cells. But it appears but some some circadian rhythms and function seem to be due to the mediators and some seem to be uh, related to uh, the intrinsic fluctuations. And we'll go over some of that. And then what, what I feel bad that I really haven't gotten clear is what the implications for health are. I, I worked on that all day today and once before. Okay. <clears throat> now, besides the neuroendocrine mediators we talked about, the other big um, so when there's when there's disruptions to circadian rhythms that people typically look at for health uh, reasons, uh, most people talk about either phase shifting or sleep deprivation. Right? Things that would affect circadian rhythms. Well, when you do either of those, 
one of the big things besides the circadian rhythms is just is the sleep. Right? And sleep itself has uh, effects on many of these variables. So it's difficult to disentangle uh, the effects of alterations in sleep versus alterations in the circadian rhythm patterns. So that, that's a big one that, that people look at. The neuroendocrine mediators, in some ways, it's, it, it doesn't really matter if it's secondary to cortisol or epinephrine changes. Um, but you know, in terms of bio, understanding the biology, it's, it's something that you definitely want to look at. Um, some of these uh, neuroendocrine mediators peak um, in the active phase, early in the active phase. And this would be, these are things that, that uh, typically uh, are opposite for diurnal and nocturnal species. So if you look at uh, mice that are active at night, um, their cortisol rises as you're going into the dark phase. In humans, their cortisol rises early in the morning as because that's their active phase. So it's not related to, to light and dark, it's related, related to the uh, circadian uh, activity. Some of them peak in, uh, in the active phase, some of them peak when you're asleep, uh, during the dark phase, but, um, <coughs> and growth hormone and prolactin are, are two hormones that have uh, immune implications that um, have that pattern. Okay, so here's uh, some examples, and what this does is uh, separates whether or not the, um, in this case this was a human, um, is, is, is allowed to sleep or is kept awake, right? And so some of the rhythms uh, are dependent upon sleeping and some are not. So, um, like with a growth hormone, um, in the, the weight condition is not really much of a rhythm. So you lose it there. Same thing with prolactin. Cortisol uh, doesn't seem to really matter. So it's, it's not dependent upon sleep and not sleep. Epinephrine, again, they show uh, similar rhythms there. And norepinephrine, like epinephrine. And then some of the immune responses, again, if you just look at uh, IL-6 in monocytes, uh, that's the macrophages, um, there's a rhythm there, uh, TNF-alpha production, IL-12. Again, some of these disappear when you, when you uh, keep the person awake. Um, <coughs> IL-12 is a critical uh, cytokine for uh, activation of um, uh, dendritic cells. And then the, the most important, one of the more important um, suppressive cytokines or um, inflammation resolving cytokines is IL-10 and it also has a, a circadian rhythm. So there are clear circadian rhythms, some of which um, depend on uh, sleep and some which don't. What <clears throat> the, this was a nice review that showed that um, different components of the uh, immune system have opposite um, effects, and some are related to epinephrine, and some are related to cortisol. And the sort of uh, uh, metaphor that they used for it was that there are day workers and night workers. In the so, um, and these are some of the, the, the changes that occur uh, in different kinds of immune cells. So there are fluctuations in naive um, cytotoxic T cells, that's, those are CTLs, uh, there's in naive T helper cells, um, <clears throat> but the ones that have actually um, been activated before and are now a memory phenotype, they have um, different fluctuations than, than some of the, um, in particular, the, um, what was it? Okay, well, I'm uh, not sure what I was, the point I was going to make there. Okay. Um, some of these have the opposite, so they're higher in the light than in the dark, so uh, natural killer cells, and the T cells are higher in the dark. Okay. Um, and this is the epinephrine rhythm. So there's an a, a inverse relationship between uh, ones that are responsive to, to a decrease in cortisol or an increase in epinephrine that they respond to. 
So different components of the immune system respond differently. And this is to just sort of highlight that the rhythms that are described here are the same for uh, mice and humans, but opposite with respect to light and dark because one's not thermal. So when uh, rodents, when humans are asleep, rodents are active. Um, and they, these are some of the, the study, the endpoints that have been looked at in terms of uh, this, this, the functional cytotoxicity of uh, NK cells when you take them out in the dish, um, and lymphocytes, their ability to proliferate, their ability to respond to um, mitogenic stimuli, all of these things uh, fluctuate across the, the, the circuit. So uh, this, as I said before, the way um, they describe this is that some cell types are like cable persons at night. Um, naive T cells are higher at night, and some of the activated cytotoxic T cells are higher during the day. So, um, and the idea, you know, at least the justification of that or rationale for why that might be is um, at night you're restoring, you want to build up uh, naive T cells, but you want to have your uh, cytotoxic cells that are actually going to respond acutely to a pathogen uh, higher in anticipation. That's the time of day or night when you're more likely to actually be wounded and face a pathogen. So it makes sense that way. <clears throat> also, in terms of how uh, circadian rhythms in the immune system interact, uh, there's some suggestion that there's um, the immune responses have feedback on uh, affecting the circadian rhythms themselves. Um, there is evidence that cytokines can affect uh, the phase of rhythms by um, <coughs> melatonin, TNF alpha can uh, do that. There is um, direct effects of TNF alpha on in a, in a SCN and a spice preparation. So inflammatory cytokines there. Um, affect the neuronal activity recordings. Um, there was one that, that claimed to be uh, changes in the SEN following sepsis, which is, um, it's actually, in this case, it was L, just LPS, so it wasn't actually the, um, <coughs> the bacteria itself, but the, the, the uh, pathogen, the active part of it. Um, but the effects were, were pretty subtle. So it was like just a small change in the, so there was no difference in the period or phase of the rhythm, but when they re-entrained, they re-entrained a little more quickly. So there seemed to be a pretty subtle effect there. Um, but they did also see prolonged activation of microglias in the yes, yeah. So there could be some effects there. So how big are the functional effects? So this is a, an old paper. And even looks like an old paper. It looks like they shaded it with a pencil. Um, and this was from '95, uh, where they showed that there was a circadian difference, circadian variation in proliferation of T cells in response to tetanus toxin antigen. So this is taking T cells out of the uh, mouse at different times of day, and then just exposing it to. Um, what's it? No, this one was. This one was not. Uh, this is actually uh, in vivo. Um, and there, there was a, a reduction at 10 in the morning um, circadian time compared to other times. And they correlated it with a, a, the difference in um, cortisol, which is highest at 10. Uh, that, you know, again, from an immunologist's point of view, what they're more interested in is the difference between this and that. Okay. So this is baseline without the tetanus toxin. And, and so they're interested in, you know, here are a 50-fold change, and this is maybe a 20% reduction in that. So that's why they haven't gotten too excited about it. But again, these things could have um, implications. Um, so this was a, from another review of what some of the uh, factors are that um, circadian, <coughs> I was interested, I hadn't been following the circadian system enough 
to realize how much the cot gene, uh, genes change in the um, arcuate too, to know the tanocytes and all the ventricles, not just the old skin anymore. So, so are those are those components driving, or do they respond to SCN? Are they entrained by SCN? Sam can answer that. Yeah, there's direct efferent projections from the SCN to the ARC nucleus. But who drives whom? The SCN drives the ARC. The ARC without the SCN in, in uh, slice culture dampens and desynchronizes over time. Okay. The SCN can live and maintain its rhythm, like amplitude and uh, period, for even like years. In di like, well, at least a year. Years in, in a dish? In a dish. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, Shin Yamazaki kept the SCN slice in the dish for over a year, and it still had its rhythm. The arcuate nucleus. Damn. It's out of its brain. That science fiction movie where they keep the brain in the dish and yeah. it takes over the odor. Yeah. <laughs> for a year. Whereas the arcuate <laughs> nucleus. Uh, well, I mean, Dan I remember out I mean, Dan, Dan, Dan Green. Dan Green from you know a few days. Was <laughs> what does this guy do to I don't know. I wish I knew. I wish I could do what he does. Yeah? You think he makes it up? I hope not. But I mean, gotta wonder. He's well known in the field, so I guess so. Not. <laughs> <laughs> you can't visit. <laughs> but the evidence is that the argument is driven by the SCN. But it does feedback, it has projections back to the SCN. Synapse on, but do they? They do can they functionally do anything for the SCN. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, they can shift. The, I think the SCN can shift in response to signals from the RQ. Yes. More and more complicated. Um, okay, so that was kind of news to me. I knew about so um, output to CRH in the PDN. So that's corticotropic releasing hormone in the paraventricular nucleus, uh, and then there's autonomic activity from the um, catecholamines, those, have, and also from the uh, adrenal cortex, the glucocorticoids. cords, those are the, the two main drivers of the extrinsic modification of, of the immune system by uh, circadian rhythms. The pineal gland <coughs> has got to be involved in some way, but for, uh, actually, I have done a circadian rhythm experiment in my life. Um, some 30 years ago, I, I uh, found circadian rhythms and estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus, and it was due to uh, melatonin. Anyway, we did some melatonin, but the melatonin literature, I don't know if it's gotten any better, but back then, it was like, it was so confusing and so contradictory, and melatonin would do anything and everything. It was like, I don't know if it's still, is it still it, It's a little better, but melatonin was thought to do anything and everything for a long time. Yeah. 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 Until you tried it in your own lab. Um, okay. So, um, I guess that's all the ones get down in that. So then, uh, what, what's, what's new is, is this um, increasing evidence for inherent circadian aspects in immune cells. So, uh, and one paper in particular found uh, they talked about, this I think was in PNAS, about the clock gene enhancing NF-kappa B transcription. Okay, so NF-kappa B is nuclear factor kappa beta, or kappa B uh, for B cells, uh, but it's a main transcription factor for inflammatory responses everywhere. Um, and so the fact that there was a direct interaction between the clock and NF-kappa B transcription was news and exciting for how it could be uh, intrinsic application. Um, so functionally it produced circadian variations in responses to lipopolysaccharide, which is a, a classic uh, TLR4 agonist, which means it's a, a piece of a pathogen. Okay, so uh, this showed that the um, response to pathogens was modified by the intrinsic rhythms uh, of clock genes in isolated uh, immune cells. 
So in particular, it was shown that the clock complex was a P65 subunit of N kappa B. So it was a direct interaction of the uh, clock gene products with uh, the, the main transcription factor for inflammation. And in terms of um, the functional implications of this, um, <coughs> I'm really showing this for the the one um, little chart A that when you so if you um, treat animals with LPS, depending on how much you give them, um, they may die. So it's like septic shock, which is a <coughs> septic shock is responsible for, I don't remember how many, probably 300,000 deaths a year, something, something crazy. So a lot, a lot of people in hospitals, what they ultimately succumb to is a septic shock when uh, infections become, basically once infection becomes uh, in, this, in the blood, then it's spread and you get all these inflammatory responses happening everywhere instead of localized. So if, if when you get an inflammatory response locally and you get vascular leakage, that's a good thing, okay? Because it brings cells and proteins to the wound and helps it respond. If you get vascular leakage everywhere, uh, you die, okay? You, you drown, your lungs uh, leak, everything, doesn't work. So many people die from septic shock. And what this shows is, is um, a related to the clock gene uh, variation is a uh, circadian, it is a clock gene related difference in, in survival. <coughs> Clearly in that situation, uh, it's important. There was another um, recent paper we found, and I think this actually might have been the one that is supposed to be discussed. So, so maybe we shouldn't discuss it now, or maybe we should all discuss it. Uh, since, uh, let me skip through that. So, and this, this is a, so that, uh, this was one I thought was worth uh, looking at. And this is, um, this was a phase shifting. So, so a lot of uh, the, the functional implication things are looking at shift work because that's where circadian rhythms get uh, disrupted. But this is also an area where I, I really knew even less than about general circadian rhythms because in terms of what happens when you just phase shift an animal or person repeatedly. Have you talked a lot about that in this class? A little bit, but one of those one papers about it that we started out talking about, it shortens your life if you're a chronic phase shifting. Yeah, I mean, it does everything bad. So all kinds of diseases uh, are more common, and, and so, but in terms of uh, how that happens. No, we didn't talk about mechanism, just as a phenomenon. Well, why circadian rhythms, why, you, why it's better to stay in synchrony. So, but, but you, you do re-entrain when you... Basically. Right, but these, these conditions are where they, they shift them and give them a few days and they shift them again, so you never right. really get re-stabilized. Right, okay. So. That's what I found interesting about this one. So they did phase shifting of, of animals repeatedly, and, and I couldn't really, I wasn't, I didn't really know whether this was convincing or not, because they said that it disrupts the NK cell clock genes, but there's still, and these are isolated NK cells and, um, of, of clock genes in NK cells, and it looks to me like there's still rhythm, it's just, it's just wrong. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like out of phase with the other. So the other thing I didn't understand in, in several of these studies that I looked at, which I'm not going to present here, but is when they did repeated phase shifting, um, and some of them were like, um, yeah, repeated phase shifting. And some, they said some of the animals retrained, some didn't. Then how they get the data from a certain circadian time point if they don't know where the animals are in that time. How do they get group data when individual animals respond differently to these phase shifts? Well, let's say kind of getting, they, just, they just reckon it from the new lighting cycle. You know, so they put them on new lighting right, cycle. But, but an animal could be, have a rhythm that's just not been trained to the new light cycle right. yet. Exactly. And yeah. so it would look like, because you're, you're doing group data, you pull the group data from all the animals and you say there's no rhythm because it's you're basically on the clock with animals, so you not have gotten there yet. 
Well, that's yeah, and that's one of the one of the issues is you know how fast does it take to re-entrain? Do do different parts of the body, different tissues re-entrain at different rates? Yeah. And what's the individual variation in humans? It's a lot. Uh, you know, hopefully in experimental animals, it's you can control that better. Well, but what what uh, so NK cells um, are the natural killer cells, and they've been trying to be important for some kinds of cancer surveillance. So uh, NK cells don't generally attack all kinds of cancer, but certain kinds of cancers are sensitive to the natural killer cells. And in this case, this was an um, incidence of uh, lung tumors developing in these animals. And what they showed was the animals that had been repeatedly shifted um, had a much higher frequency of developing the, the lung tumors. Right? And the percent of the had tumors basically doubled, and the percent was more than one tumor, even more than that. But what I found particularly interesting was the, the last uh, graph, which was um, some of the animals, they said, re-entrained, and some were free-running. And the ones that were free-running didn't develop nearly as many tumors as the ones that were uh, re-entrained each time. But it was like, if you say, to hell with light and dark, I'm going to keep my rhythms on my own. It's not as bad as if you are you know, always trying to, to adjust it. So I thought that was interesting. There was another one of these phase shift um, jet lag experiments done in animals with um, showing uh, adverse effects in, in the animals. And again, this one I think was, uh, this is the one that also, right? Okay. So, right. <clears throat> One of the, so this is a huge effect, right? So um, on, this is on body temperature in response to LPS. So t the typical body response, temperature response to LPS is a, is a um, drop in body temperature. Okay, you go hypothermic. Um, and um, then when the, the, the ones that did not be phase shifted uh, came back, they pretty much lost the rhythmicity, which was, was kind of strange. Um, but the ones who had been repeatedly phase shifted um, had a greatly reduced body temperature. This is 26 degrees. That's, um, that's chilly. <laughs> so, and then, then they kept this uh, rhythm, but th this, uh, I don't know if you noticed, read closely enough in the paper, that um, this rhythm was due, they said, to the chamber temperature. Right, so this is just the animals passively following it. And that, they said, persisted after the demise of the animals. <laughs> what? So, <laughs> like, I mean, talk about a bizarre experiment. It's like, we're going to let these animals die and they continue to monitor their temperature for like a couple of days. And sure enough, there was a circadian rhythm in their, their body temperature. So maybe they were not you know, like completely <laughs> dead. <laughs> Uh, we would not allow that. Can't make measurements on dead animals. So, um, but then when you when you look at the the um, cytokine responses, then they weren't all that impressive. Again, for because they're showing the response to um, LPS, but they're not showing the baseline. So, you know, if it's like from virtually zero to you know, there. You know, that, it's, it's not as nearly as good a response. So, um, okay. So, I guess that's what I had to, other than just the paper that was assigned for, for discussion. So, I, so I'm done. Any, any questions? Yeah. <coughs> Do these on my scale like fevers? Yeah, in, in a normal, um, so an initial response to the pathogen would be a fever. When they go into a sepsis, then they go down. So that's, that's the but the, I don't, they have a normal fever response. Yeah. So was that the drop in the temperature, high temperature? Well, they didn't really show a fever response, but that, this, is, this is sort of beyond the normal fever. This is sepsis where the animals are. <coughs> okay. 
and that, that's, <coughs> that's what happens here in these two. Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to make a comment, so you go ahead. I was just, uh, in a lot of these, they're challenging them with LPS, challenging yeah. with LPS after the shifting uh, right. scenario. Right. So then the, the death is resulting from an uncontrolled immune response, not from an actual infection. Right, right. So there's no, there's no actual pathogen. Right. Uh, and um, one of the things I wondered about with this is, because that was so dramatic, um, was there's circadian variations in liver function. And um, LPS is pretty, um, pretty sharp dose response kind of things. So if you had a very, if you didn't clear LPS as well, um, it could put you over. So a lot of people here at U of I use LPS just to induce mild sickness. And um, I, I didn't have a chance to compare the dose. There's, there's also like 800 different variations on LPS um, and then what bacteria you get and stuff. Um, so, but it's typically, you know, you get a transient effect and you're better in six hours or something. Um, but if you give them too much, then, then you get this. So I didn't know whether if the, they, the, the jet lag could be modifying liver clearance because it is conjugated to white protein, um, and carry proteins and protein by the liver. Um, and I, I tried Absolutely to find that. Could. If I couldn't find what happens to the liver function with jet lag. I looked. 